Got some folks coming in. Uh, welcome everybody. We're just uh, getting organized here, welcoming you all to this Zoom space. Uh, and uh, in just a few minutes, we'll get going uh, in a proper way. All right, we have Ben Barnes, Chief of the Shawnee Nation. We have Don Bigler. We have uh, many people joining us. Kim Gotcha from NARF, uh, Lola, Michael McNally, uh, Sue from NARF, a variety of students, Sunaina. It's so great to see people logging on from all about. So this is this is happy news. All right, we're live on Facebook now too, so we'll have some folks uh, joining there as well. Well, I hope people are having a good day and that it's a beautiful day here in Santa Barbara. It's it's gorgeous again. Um, <clears throat> I know I, I just talked to some folks in South Dakota. They're also having a nice day, a little less nice in Denver today, I understand, but spring's coming. Okay. Well, as people keep filtering in, I'm just going to start here. Um, welcome. It's it's a real honor to host you all. And um, my name is Greg Johnson. I'm the director of the Walter H. Capp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And um, it's I'm going to introduce our guests in just a moment. I, I want to say a few words about the symposium. Uh, in which we're situated tonight. This is Ethics in Place, uh, Indigenous Peoples and the Future of Principled Democracy. Uh, it's, it's a big title. It's a lot of ground to cover, but we've been working hard at it all year long. Those of you who've joined us, I think uh, uh, I can speak for myself. I'm better for the, having been part of these conversations, learning about uh, Indigenous peoples, their continuing role in our democracy, and how um, justice might better be served by way of them. And there are a variety of mechanisms uh, by which that might be possible. Tonight, we're gonna hear about a very important one, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, right now, I would like to say just a little bit about upcoming events. And Alma, if you could show us that first slide, please. Thanks. So uh, in the spring iteration of the symposium, we have this event, April 20th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, Mount Shasta to Mauna Kea Indigenous Solidarities in Action. And this is an evening with Pua Case and Chief Kayleen Sisk of the Winneman Wintu Nation uh, talking about their longtime collaboration in protecting sacred places and their ceremonial work across those spaces. I'm super excited. They're both uh, incredibly compelling speakers and their story of, uh, of moving across the Pacific Ocean to one another's mountains to nurture those spaces is quite powerful. So please join us. Uh, next. Okay, and then news flash from today. We finally have this pinned down. April 27th at 4 p.m., we will be joined by Nick Tilson, who you're seeing here. He is the president and CEO of the NDN Collective out of uh, South Dakota. He's Oglala, Lakota, uh, calls Pine Ridge home. You may know his uh, face from uh, the national headlines on July 3rd, he was arrested at uh, Mount Rushmore for protesting then President Trump's visit and related issues. Uh, but that's not all he's known for. Uh, the Indian Collective's been instrumental in the ongoing land back campaign that you may have heard about. And also just really place-based environmental ethics from an indigenous point of view. He's worked in this domain for a long time, speaks directly to the issues we're engaged with in the symposium. So I'm delighted to have him. And we're working on other programming for the spring. So take a look at our website, see what's coming and, and please do join us. Okay, we can end that, thank you. Um, all right, again, I wanna thank the audience here. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna thank our supporters, our donors who make these events possible. And I wanna thank our staff, Associate Director Maeve Duvoy, um, 
our student assistants, uh, Alma Mendoza and Madden Westland. Uh, they do the important work that gets things done here. A note on logistics. So uh, this is being recorded and it'll be available on our website at the Walter Cap Center uh, soon, probably by tomorrow. It's also being simulcast on Facebook if your Zoom link uh, isn't your preferred method. After our speakers engage us, we will have some time for audience Q&A. So use the Q&A function to write out your questions and I'll do my best to field those. I want to acknowledge the land where I am, institutionally situated here in Santa Barbara at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Chumash peoples and their various relatives. Uh, this is a beautiful land. It's, it's not an empty land. It's had these, these people have lived here since time immemorial and they continue to live here. They continue to call it home. We need to honor that institutionally. We need to do our best to reckon with what that might mean in an ongoing way, by way of human remains collections, uh, by way of institutional work being done elsewhere, for example, in Hawaii, uh, to really take stock of how institutions relate to indigenous peoples. That work has only really begun. I'm hoping this symposium continues to be a part of the, the unfolding of the issues so that we can uh, treat them in a ethical way. All right, now I'd like to invite our guests, uh, Professor Kristen Carpenter and Judge uh, Greg Bigler to, to join me on the screen if they would. Well, welcome to you both. It's so great to have you here. And um, I know we're in different time zones. Very much appreciate uh, that it's late in your day. And um, but it's an important conversation. I'm so excited that, that we could have this here. I just want to say a few words about the United Nations Declaration. And then I'll introduce our speakers and then turn it over to them. Uh, by the way, there's a link in the chat for the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration, a link. It's not a long document. If you're not familiar with it, click it, check it out. Our speakers may make reference to some of the articles or not, but it's, it's, it's there. United Nations Declaration, sometimes called the UNDRIP, it came about in 2007 after decades and decades of labor by indigenous peoples around the world, uh, working with various allies to articulate this document. It was the United States became a signatory in 2010 under the Obama administration. Efforts towards implementation at the federal and state level and at, with various tribal nations began at that time. Needless to say, during the Trump years, those efforts slowed down. But now I think we, we all see that we're moving into a rust, robust period where um, implementation has more legs, as it were. It's an exciting time. And so why, why in the context of this symposium? Well, we've talked about land rights, repatriation, ceremonial rights, language rights, basic senses of uh, sovereignty, jurisdiction, and so forth. We've talked in many ways about how at federal and state levels, sometimes precedent is, uh, inhibits further action. We've talked about the paralyzing effect of uh, asymmetrical power frames in the government and so forth. So how do we get beyond some of these limitations? Well, there's no panacea, of course, uh, but the United Nations Declaration offers a different horizon. It offers a horizon of ideals, of ethical values that are internationally embraced in a human rights framework. That's what's so startling about it and that it speaks directly to indigenous needs in so many ways. Um, but those needs don't get met if they're not articulated and made real on the ground. And so that's what we're gonna hear about a bit tonight, uh, particularly with regard to questions about consent. One of the uh, highlight features of the UNDRIP is its insistence upon the standard of free, prior and informed consent when it comes to indigenous peoples and their land and their livelihoods um, and their jurisdictions. Um, so what does it mean for people living their ways to um, 
be approached about consent. This is what we're going to talk about in a variety of different ways. We're going to go into the micro local, the, the very specific context um, of ceremonial grounds with Judge Bigler. And then Professor Carpenter is going to help us understand some of these issues from the broader international frame and her work with the UN. I'm going to turn, they were both kind enough to provide me a biography, which I'll read and then I'll elaborate on and then I'll turn it over to them. Kristen Carpenter is the Council Tree Professor of Law and Director of the American Indian Law Program at the University of Colorado Law School. With colleagues at the Native American Rights Fund, she co-directs the project to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Professor Carpenter also holds a post at the United Nations, serving as a member from the North, uh, as the member from the North America, from North America on the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In this role, she has spent the last five years working with Indigenous peoples, nation states, and others to help realize the aims of the UN Declaration around the world, including engagements in Brazil, Canada, Finland, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, Sweden, Thailand, and the United States. Should also add that she uh, did her training at Harvard. Um, she's the author of many wonderful law review articles over the last 15 years, at least articles that have so informed my teaching and writing and that of many others. She's a master collaborator within law worlds and beyond them, even occasionally with the humanities types. And uh, she and I got to know one another primarily through her work in founding the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies at the University of Colorado, something I was also involved with and uh, came to really appreciate the kind of work she does and the kinds of communities she fosters. Justice Greg Bigler is a Yuchi Indian enrolled with the Muscogee Nation. He currently serves as the chief judge for the Muscogee Creek Nation which was the focal point of the US uh, Supreme Court's reservation case last year. This is the McGirt decision that you may have heard about. Since his graduation from Harvard Law School in 1985 and an LLM from Wisconsin Law School, he has practiced in federal Indian law and tribal law for the last 35 years. He is and has served as a judge for numerous tribal courts, attorney general for various tribes, and assisted his law per partner with their firm's US Supreme Court win in Oklahoma Tax Commission uh, v. Sac and Fox Nation in 1993. He lives in and is part of his Yuchi community, being a member of the Polecat Yuchi ceremonial grounds, helping with various duties as directed by his chiefs. He has been involved in the Yuchi language work in Yuchi language work for 25 plus years. He has consistently over this period advocated for indigenous rights recognition at the local, federal, and international level. He's also an author. We may get a sense of that tonight, I hope. An accomplished runner. Uh, he's outrun us all, I promise you that much. And he's been involved in a translation project for the Muscogee. Uh, bringing the United Nations Declaration into their language and informing it by way of their language. A link to that work is in the chat function. You can find it there. Um, and also, I was remiss, there is a link to the work of the Native American Rights Fund and Colorado Law School Project on the United Nations also in the chat function. So please take a look. All right, without further ado, I'm going to uh, disappear from the screen and turn it over to our guests. Uh, please, Justice Bigler and Professor Carpenter, welcome and thank you. And uh, I'll let uh, uh, Kristen say hello too before we proceed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to Greg Johnson for that very kind introduction, and I'll say more about you, Greg, in a moment. And thank you, Judge Bigler, for the kind uh, acknowledgement as well. Senator Gassada. And uh, uh, I think that uh, in our uh, discussions, uh, Kristen had uh, Professor Carpenter said I could go first. And so uh, we'll start. And uh, uh, again, Senator Gassada to everybody. Um, and uh, this has been a long and uh, strange, unfortunate, hard year for many of us, for most of us, um, especially in the uh, Native communities, tribal communities. And uh, whether you're, uh, especially if you're working professionally, 
you have probably spent far more time on Zoom and on uh, cyber links than you had ever thought was going to happen 15 months ago. Uh, and, uh, I think that a lot of us have that weariness, tiredness. Uh, I'm not sure you, uh, I'm thankful that you've tuned in who are here. I'm not sure you really want to hear another Zoom lecture. Uh, so I did not really know how to proceed in particular um, to keep it interesting. Uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, uh, Professor Johnson mentioned I am Yuchi. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that in a moment. Uh, Yuchis are uh, within the Muskogee Creek Nation, although we are not Muskogee. And uh, that may be a discussion for a later time also. But <coughs> uh, time of pandemic, I had uh, decided I was going to commit myself to writing. I was always inspired by the number of articles that my friends, Professor Carpenter and Riley uh, churn out and others. Uh, I'm not academically bent that way, but I did do some things in particular. Uh, one I want to share is styled on what we call a traditional de'ile within our language, uh, told traditionally by uh, older women uh, or stories, but also shared amongst adults sometimes used to be, but not so much anymore, unfortunately. But uh, this one was the a rabbit and the last old woman. And uh, so When it used to be that some of them were still here, they said Rabbit was thinking he had not seen his friend Bear in a very long time. He decided the next day he would go to find him. So that next morning he woke up and uh, began his way. He realized he had not seen many of his friends in this time either. As he began walking down the trail, he thought of the many times he'd gone this way before, past the briar patches in the fields. Things though seemed to have changed. They were different, he thought. As he went over the hill, he looked around as he always did to see if any turkeys were there. He'd brought his sack along just in case, but again, as it had been for a long time, there were no turkeys. He paused to listen, but he didn't even hear a faint gobble. With a slight shrug, he went on his way. No turkeys, no dinner, no meal tonight, he laughed. Finally, in the distance, he saw saw gay bear and called out to him, Dik ati, dik ati, ha anle, my friend, my friend, wait. Sage seemed happy to see Shachwane and told him, Sachi, sit here by my fire and we will visit. Rabbit was happy to see his friend, but he thought Bear did not seem his usual big self. Rabbit had always been a bit jealous of his friend, his size and his strength. He asked Sage, how are you? Is everything okay? Bear paused a moment and said, you are the first one I've seen in a very long time. I don't know where everyone else has gone. Shachwane wasn't sure what Bear meant by that and asked, gone, what do you mean? Did you eat them? Bear looked at Rabbit and laughed. I might have, my friend. At that, Rabbit stepped back a moment. Bear continued, no, I didn't eat them. Maybe they're not all gone, but when I do see them and talk to them, they run away or they just look at me like my dog. I don't think they understand. It's very strange. It's like they're not really here. Then Bear was quiet. They sat there for a long time, not saying anything, just watching the fire. It was getting late, so Rabbit told Bear he'd better return home, so they shook hands. As the Rabbit turned to leave, Sage said, Shachwane, we have been friends, visiting, dancing, sharing meals for a very long time. I can't remember a time not being your friend. We have many stories, but I think this may be our last. Senlagasada, thank you. You're a good friend, my brother. Always remember, if this comes to be, always be yourself. And with that, Rabbit left and Bear was gone. Rabbit thought about that as he walked home. He put his hand on his stomach, remembering, quietly returning. The woods seemed smaller as he walked, the fields overgrown. Rabbit felt lonely, and he decided he would stop by the old woman's house on the way. Besides, she always had something to eat. Maybe she would know what Sage was talking about. The old woman knew many things and she might know why these things were coming to be. As he walked up to her home, he yelled out, Golaha, Golaha, are you home? He heard a voice, huh, I hate the gun. Yes, come in. There she was sitting at her table. She asked him if he was hungry, which he was. After she fed him and she told him that she was happy to see him. 
She too had not had visitors in a long time. Rabbit noticed she looked very old, even for her, and frailer. He mentioned this. She looked at him and said, an old woman gets lonely by herself. You were always the best storyteller, he said. And you always gave me so many to tell, she laughed. Rabbit wasn't sure that was a good thing, but she was a good cook, so he didn't mind too much, and told her, I'm surprised you've had no visitors. She continued, yes, I know. I have so many stories to tell, but no one to tell them to. Rabbit finished his soup and was about to leave when she turned to him, stopping him. I'm an old woman. I may not be here the next time. None of us know what will come. None of us have thought this would happen, but it has. I have known to tell about you or the others. You have already lost many of your friends. We don't have a word for this, so I will use theirs. I am sorry. I tried. Send like Asada, Shachwane. Thank you, my little friend, for all you have done. With that, she spit on the floor and Rabbit turned and left. When he looked back, the old woman was gone. Rabbit began walking home, wondering what she'd meant. Again, it seemed very strange and he shivered a little bit, a bit scared. He thought, I just don't know. And he began, hop and he began hopping home. That's what they will say. As I said, that's a story pattern upon uh, stories that we've told and uh, about rabbit and others, Sage, rabbit, bear. Uh, there's references in there that probably uh, other Yuchis would understand and uh, know other stories. But Yuchi itself, as I said, mentioned, I'm Yuchi, and we're what we call a language isolate. Uh, my friends who are uh, linguists who have worked with us and studied the language tell me that uh, as far as they can tell, to find a possible relationship between our language and another language, you have to go back maybe 6,000 years. So we're not related to the Muscogee language, we're not related to Navajo or the Cherokees or Algonquin or any other of the languages. Uh, our culture is similar to the Muscogees, but our language is separate. So that means that Yuchis have been Yuchi for 6,000 years. That means we have been who we are since before Rome was founded, before Athens, before China came into existence, before the pyramids were built. That is a very long time to be who we are, to have come this far and to be where we are today. Within our language, we have a slightly different way that men and women talk. We have a form of the men say, uh, Hena, for he, another Yuchi man. Women say, Sena, for a Yuchi man. So there's a differences between the way the men and women talk when they're referring to a Yuchi man or a Yuchi woman or children. However, when we speak of others, anybody else, other Indians, white people, Spanish, African-American, dogs, cats, birds, anything animate, it's Wena. They're all the same to us. They're simply animate non yuchis Now, if this worldview was tied within us of having the separation of a language, perhaps that's part of why we maintained who we were being such a small tribe and still maintained who we were. because we separated ourselves in our language. Now, unfortunately, uh, my mother and her siblings are the very last of the fluent speakers. My mother passed some five years ago, four years ago. My aunt Maxine is still uh, living, but she's 96 now, I believe. But we've been fortunate to have some young people who have truly reacquiring the language. So we're in, we're in a lucky spot at that point. But we've managed to maintain our separate identity. And is that in part because of the worldview contained within our language? And if that is true, and it made, it made just a supposition on my part, if that's true for our language, what more of our worldview contained in our ceremonial life, which is unique to us? We are the only people at Polecat Stomp Grounds, our small group that holds our lizard dance, who holds our over the hill dance, that does these other things, no place else in the world 
The other Muskogee grounds who have stomp grounds that are similar are not the same. The other two Uchi grounds did not do the full day dances and lizard dance like we do. So when we were translating the declaration into Muskogee, uh, again, that's a separate language, but I seemed it was important to me as I believed. <coughs> My friends who were uh, working with the International United Nations and, and the declarations at that time said that, uh, as I understood, uh, of the 46 articles in the declaration, Article 3 is the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples. That was the most contentious amongst the nation states because it wrecked, they were afraid of what it might mean as to the rights of these people. That perhaps would they try to separate out? Would they have their own independence? Very contentious. Nonetheless, that self-determination was placed in that Article 3. However, when we were translating this article and we had uh, the fluent speakers uh, and several of the traditional chiefs and other leaders within our small group that was translating it, they got to that Article 31, which has the cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions. And uh, it's a fairly long paragraph, kind of technical, and they came up with a rather precise translation of that. Uh, that article is also what uh, I think is involved, if I remember right, and Kristen can correct me, in the uh, WIPO, uh, uh, the International uh, uh, Property Organization, which is the international corollary to our trade and pat patent offices, protecting uh, copyrights, uh, trademarks, uh, development of uh, patents on medicines and everything else. <coughs> in uh, the declaration though, we consider that cultural expressions and uh, knowledge, stories, patterns, maybe even cloth patterns from the uh, uh, Guatemalan weavers. Well, when they went through that with a literal translation, they paused after they're done with it and said, they started talking amongst themselves in Muskogee. And they said, came back and said, we have a way of saying this. We understand what they're saying. At our ceremonial grounds, those old men used to stand up and talk to us. And they said this brief word in Muskogee sentence, and they translated it back into English. And they said, this is what we're talking about in our language, this article. And they said in English, what it means is that now these are our ways that were given to us and they are very sacred and they're not to be played with. These things, what they meant was that these are ours. They came from the old people. They came from the creator. There are people who are authorized to say them or do them. These are things which should not be taken out in the public. There are things that should not be taken out amongst other people. And there's a place to do them and a time to do them. And they should not be played with. They said to them, that is the heart of what this declaration is about. So it seemed that was a very powerful statement to me. Now, as I said, as we went forward in this uh, coronavirus, everything shut down. Uh, and we at our ceremonial ground at Polcat had to decide if we were gonna go forward. When we started up in the spring, which actually we're gonna start up in a few weeks with some of our early things, about March, April, we had to decide how we were going to go forward because we were concerned about how that would impact our people. We didn't know how the trans was being trans transmitted. We didn't want to risk our old people or our young people. So we kind of backed off a little bit and so how we did certain things. And then as we went forward, we continued on. And I visited with some of my friends at other ceremonial places, other uh, stomp grounds, other ceremonial places, uh, some of my friends at other tribes who have different ways uh, to visit and see how they handle things. And as I did, they were very, uh, we were happy to share and visit with each other and we did it over Zoom. But uh, <coughs> that was one of our concerns. And each one of those groups, small groups, oftentimes a handful of traditional leaders and people had to decide for themselves how they would move forward because they couldn't risk losing one person. When you only have eight or 10 people who know how to carry forward a ceremony and three of them are old people and those three should end up in the hospital and pass away. 
you're risking everything that has been given to you for the past thousands of years. They made different decisions based upon what they had commitments. And as we went forward and I spoke with them and they, they're willing to share and I'm, they've asked, uh, said that perhaps I might write about this as we go forward in the future as to how those considerations. We consider these things to have obligations at our, at our fireplace. We have to keep that fireplace going. We have medicines. We have dances for those old people that have gone on, these ancestors. We have a, a dance to remember and what we were given as far as how we came about. Uh, my friends, the Shawnees, have prayers for those old people know they're still here and they're continuing on. Uh, my friends over at Sauk have feasts that they have to do so that those people can continue on what the, on that other side. Uh, so we each have these obligations. And we've tried to do best we can to carry forward. Uh, maybe it's reduced. Some of the some of the uh, some of the uh, stomp grounds went on, uh, decided to go forward with their dances and uh, completely. Some have decided to all but back off in the meantime. That may change this year. We don't know. But each did it based upon their understanding of their obligations and needs to these things: spirits, medicines, bundles, the fireplace those old people. And as we went forward in that, talking about that, I've started to wonder if we have an obligation to those things. And this isn't like a church where you pray and you can do it anywhere. Drive up in the parking lot and you stand, sit in your cars and the preacher's on top of the roof and they have a speaker and you turn into channel 39 or 89 and you can have your little prayer service. Many of us have to do certain things at a certain place in a certain way or we don't continue. But if we have that obligation, then I started wondering, do those spirits have a right to those things? We have an obligation to them to continue on, but do they have a right from us to have that continued? I don't know. I mean, that's something I've just started turning around in my mind over the past six months, nine months. But I think it is something that my people, my friends who are traditional people, the clan leaders, the chiefs, would understand and would probably think about and talk about. But this is a very different perspective than what you have in American jurisprudence. Uh, I think there's some books I saw that, uh, I think it's Michael McNally has a book out that talks about these little things. But we have, things which must be done in order for our religion to continue, for our ceremonies to continue. It's not simply accepting that Jesus was given by the Father to forgive our sins, but rather we must do certain actions. We are participatory, and there are certain places they must be done. And when we talk about these sacred spots, I had never ever thought about our ceremonial grounds as a sacred spot. I, to me, it was Bear Butte, it was the Black Hills, it was those places at Navajo, the, mount, the mountains of the Navajo. And yet, if I think about it, in Yuchi, what we call our ground is Sa Sa, and that uh, Sa means ground, San, San Le means good, Sa means our pure, clean. We have to clean that ground before we, we do our ceremonies. We have to doctor it. We have medicines there. So I guess in a way it is probably sacred. We can't do it someplace else. We can't just pick it up and do wherever we want to do it. But, and so we see all these uh, people supporting the fight for sacred sites. But we must remember that these sacred sites continue their sacredness because they're tied to the land through the people who continue the ceremonies. We have that fireplace, but we have an obligation to the fireplace and, it, and it has a, we have a duty to it. And only by us feeding it does that fire continue on. When we go away, I don't know what happens to it. I'm not sure. Uh, those places that were in the east that we had when we left, I don't know what's happened to them. We don't know where they are. I don't know what's happened to them. I know what happens if we disappear now. Those things stop. 
the sun sets back in the west and the world ends as far as the Uchis are concerned. It is we that continue it, this world. That is not a perspective that is understood or comprehended in American law. I think it's something we understand amongst ourselves. There are a few of us that continue on these ways and it's not unique to Uchis or Muscogees. I think it's something that other tribes probably do but I can't speak to them. But if it's not an American law, where are we gonna find it? Well, first we have to understand it ourselves and our own people have to participate and carry it forward. That is our responsibility. We have a duty. But assuming we do that in our own laws, our own, own comprehension, and the federal law doesn't understand it, doesn't comprehend it, where do we find that right, that recognition? Well, this UN Declaration has some 46 articles which contains many things in it, health, welfare, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, language, elderly, women. And so perhaps if we start bringing that human right perspective into federal law, we will find a way to base our understanding in a way that can help protect us. Now, there's a lot of things that uh, I simply won't talk about or don't know enough of to talk about. But for instance, in our very concrete terms for us at our ceremonial grounds, we have willow that we have to place upon our arbors when we renew them. And there's other medicines we need other places too. And so when we go to gather willow on the public lands or on the easements on the roadside, which is publicly public property and it's uh, mowed and everything else, Every year, but last year, out of the past five years, the, the law, state law enforcement, local law enforcement, highway patrol, county sheriffs have stopped, harassed, and arrested some of our young people as they have gathered willow for our ceremonial grounds. Gathering willow, which is otherwise cut down by the county tractors, but they harass us for it. Uh, if you have a ceremonial fireplace and you happen to do something on that, in which is non uh, tribal lands, you have to get a state permit. And some of our people have said uh, in the past that maybe that's changed now with the reservation boundaries being uh, uh, re found re intact. But our people were never gonna ask for a permit to, to light the fire to continue on our ways. So these are kind of some of the things that we talk about. Now, uh, When uh, I was young, uh, a little bit younger in my 20s, or my chief at that time was in his uh, 80s. And uh, I was very, uh, I was trying to learn what I could at that point. Uh, I didn't know what to, I didn't even have a clue as to what I didn't know. But he's very kind and uh, willing to uh, help uh, tell me when I had a question. And so there's a few things I asked about and he was very helpful. And he said, no, since you asked, I'm gonna tell you how to do this. But if somebody else wants to know, they need to ask also because they need to show initiative. They have to show that they want to do this, learn this. But he said, once you've learned this, if somebody ever asks you to do it, you have to do it. These are things that a Yuchi man should learn and he should do. So again, we get back to that obligation within our own people. And he took this in a very literal sense. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think I've gone for and on about 20 minutes. I could tell a few more stories. I had one more story I thought I might tell, but I'm gonna just circle back that um, when we talk about this, uh, the story I told about rabbit and the old woman, that is literally true with our people who these stories have all but disappeared. What happens to little rabbit and bear when our people stop telling these stories? They disappear, but that's true for our sacred sites. If we don't, remember and continue on, then what happens to them? Where do they go? So it is not simply a sacred site we need to worry about. It is the people who, who tie that place to the land and to our culture and to our language we need to be concerned about. Um, I'm gonna take five more minutes. Uh, as I said, my mom passed away here about three years, four years ago. Uh, she was born in 1921. Uh, full-blood Yuchi, didn't know any English until she went off to uh, grade school. 
uh, very, very fluent in her four little siblings. She's the oldest of the five, also the same way, grew up in a full blood house. Uh, and they used to spend a lot of time down uh, uh, with uh, her aunts and cousins. I was taking her down, to, we were driving down to Duck Creek from where we live in Sepulpa, which is in, outside of Tulsa, it's on a 30 minute drive. As so we're going down there for Friday night for a ribbon dance out in the country, we're driving there and my mom says, oh, that's Aunt Seiki's old house. I used to stay there when I was young and we'd come down here and I'd stay with Aunt May. And she's going past and she'd point, oh, there was an old cemetery. That's where my, uh, my aunt, when her baby died in childbirth, they buried that baby there. And she talked about people who lived here and there. And said, there used to be an old stomp grounds down there. And they said that Uncle Joe one night was coming back and he heard them dancing and he told his dad about it. And his dad said, there's no stomp grounds there now, but there was one there 40 years ago. And said, you stay away from there. And she said one day when she was a little, maybe 10 years old, 1930, 32, her and her cousin May decided to walk about a mile or two down the road. There was a little country store. It's still there, as a matter of fact, out in the middle of nowhere. So they went down there. Maybe they're going to get a pop or maybe they just wanted something to do. My mom said they got down there and they decided, my mom said, well, you know, Miko Behan's sister lives just about a mile north of here, up away. So they decided they'd go up there and visit her. And she said she, that that woman was so happy to see these two little girls and they they invited them in, gave them something to eat and they helped her clean and she showed them how to sew and just had a lot of fun playing with them. And finally uh, said the guiding afternoon, uh, that woman told them, well, you girls better hold, head back to your moms and your aunts, you know. And so my mom said her and May started walking back and they got back there. And I asked my mom, well, how old is Miko Behan's sister? I figured she's like 30, you know. My mom said, oh, she must have been 60 or 70, I guess. <laughs> I just started laughing. You know, I could see these two little Yuchi girls sitting there playing with this old woman talking in Yuchi and having them, teaching them how to sew and eating and they're thinking they're helping her and she's just playing, kind of watching them and then sending them on their way. Now, there's a couple things that strike me about that story is that that can't happen today for a lot of reasons. One is we don't have those type of situations where little girls can go to these old women and just spend a day with them in Yuchi doing those things which Yuchi children and Yuchi women should teach them. We don't have that safety. We don't have those Yuchi communities which are bound together in that way. We don't have those things which make us who we were, except when we consciously create them. So I think that those are some of the thoughts I had and I'm just going to stop there for the moment. Thank you, Judge Bigler. And I'm glad you told the story of the little girls and the Miko Behan's sister. I love that story. And really, I think when we listen to stories every um, time we hear them again, we learn something new. And I appreciate that. I um, appreciate also the invitation to be here with you, Judge Bigler, and with um, Professor Johnson and the many friends and colleagues who are joining us tonight. I am gonna talk about um, implementing the declaration, drawing from some of the context that Judge Bigler has so nicely set for us. And um, many of us who are working to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the United States are trying to take our lead from traditional leaders and community members, folks like Judge Bigler, who are deeply committed in their daily lives, um, their ceremonial lives, their work lives, their personal lives to keeping tribal societies alive. And um, that's really a guidepost for me. Um, and I've learned a lot from Judge Bigler and other ceremonial leaders in Oklahoma. Um, and tribal leaders, including Chief Ben Barnes, who I believe is on the call, um, a Shutter Ground Chief, uh, David Coming Deer, I don't know if he's on tonight, um, and so many others. So thank you for your wisdom. 
Um, and I, I don't see Greg Johnson on the screen at the moment, but I did want to acknowledge his leadership in convening these events with um, folks thinking about the um, ethical life of places and um, construed broadly, I think we miss uh, Professor Johnson at the University of Colorado, where he was our colleague, but are really glad to be able to work with him in these um, additional contexts. So I think I'll make three points. One is to talk about the UN Declaration and my work with the United Nations in implementing it around the world. The second is to bring the focus back to the United States um, and say something about the Native American Rights Fund and University of Colorado's joint project to implement the declaration here. And thirdly, to offer a few comments um, on the more specific topic of religious freedom, which is something that uh, many of us have been working on. It's in the news with Oak Flat this week, the Apache, sacred site that was um, almost transferred to a multinational mining corporation this month, um, but has earned a temporary reprieve by the Biden administration. And I think it's on many of us to figure out a strategy for permanent protection of it. So those are the three points I'll try to cover in um, 15 minutes. And Judge Bigler and I, together with Professor Johnson, um, are hoping to engage with all of you in conversation. Um, so I, I will save time for that. Um, Judge Bigler encouraged me to talk about how I got involved in international work. And I um, have long been a professor in federal Indian law and I practiced and still practice in federal Indian law. And that's really um, the place that I come from representing tribes in the domestic legal system of the United States. But um, over the course of my career, that's led to many um, brick walls. And there are certain areas, including religious freedom and child welfare and environmental protection, where the laws of the United States only go so far. Land rights, I should add to that too. Um, and really not far enough for tribes to survive. So for example, um, when it comes to American Indian sacred sites, the US Supreme Court has held that the federal government can destroy sacred sites located on the federal public lands, even if it will destroy the Indians religion. And that doesn't violate the First Amendment. And in the American Indian child welfare context, the Supreme Court has very narrowly construed a statute that is meant to um, protect Indian families from the history of disruption and forced removal of Indian children from their parents, such that this remedial statute is now very vulnerable um, to legal and other parties um, that do not respect its intent or its functioning in tribal communities. And with respect to land rights, it's still the case in the United States that um, tribes Aboriginal title, their traditional land tenure is not fully protected by the Fifth Amendment of the constitution. And whereas other countries have determined that um, that kind of legal standard is unfair. It violates equality, it violates non-discrimination, it violates most or some countries' uh, constitutions not to give Indian property owners the same protection as non-Indian property owners. In the United States, we still have um, discrimination in that area of the law. And um, while I've been a law professor for a long time, I've always worked with tribes on a pro bono basis. And it was, I think, in the 2000s where I kept working with tribes and hit, hitting that brick wall. And they'd say, you know, well, now what can we do? Because when it comes to protecting their children or protecting their religions, um, tribal people are not able to just give up on the struggle when they lose in the US Supreme Court, especially when the law is so unjust and the circumstances are so poignant. 
And so I, along with, um, I think lots of other folks in federal Indian law have increasingly looked to the international legal system for instruments and venues and communities of advocacy that would help us um, find arguments and find institutions and find documents that could bolster these cases and um, support tribes claims and needs in these arenas. And so I worked on a couple of petitions to UN bodies um, and I had been mentored by Jim Anaya, who was the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, who's now my law school dean. And eventually I had the opportunity um, to apply to serve on the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is one of three main bodies within the UN that's dedicated to indigenous people's rights. Um, both Jim and Aya and a friend, um, retired ambassador Keith Harper had encouraged me to apply and I did. And I was really gratified to be appointed by the UN Human Rights Council to be the member from North America um, for what has turned out to be a, a five year period of two terms. So in my work at the UN, um, I am one of seven worldwide experts who are mandated to work together to help states and indigenous peoples and industry and other parties realize the aims of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And Judge Bigler and Professor Johnson both mentioned the UN Declaration, and as probably many of you know, um, it's an instrument that many indigenous leaders from the generation before mine worked to advance um, so that there would be a worldwide consensus on minimum standards to protect indigenous people's rights um, across the board in terms of self-governance, in terms of property and land and religion and um, health and education. And one of the things, and actually here, here is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I carry it around with me all the time. Um, one of the things that I appreciate that at the declaration is that in addition to its 46 articles, some of which we can talk about specifically, it also um, articulates what I see as a holistic vision for Indigenous peoples survival and flourishing going forward. It speaks to some of those points that Judge Bigler mentioned, um, including, for example, in Article 7, the right of Indigenous peoples individually and collectively to survive as peoples. And so the concept and the experience of Indigenous peoples who wish, and I, I think you heard that so powerfully in Judge Bigler's stories and presentations, who wish to continue their ways of life. They wish following um, generations of oppression to um, reconstitute their societies, their institutions, their cultures, um, to um, revitalize those things that remain and um, bring them into subsequent generations for children and grandchildren toward um, permanent and uh, flourishing going forward. And the declaration provides that in my view in a way that nothing in federal Indian law does. Federal Indian law is good at recognizing the reserved rights of tribes, for example, in treaty cases like in the McGirt case where the Supreme Court recently recognized the retained jurisdiction of the Muscogee Creek Nation and um, probably the other similarly situated tribes in Oklahoma. And federal Indian law is good at recognizing an exclusive relationship between the United States and the tribes, but it's not terribly good at recognizing indigenous people's own laws, customs, and traditions, their own values, their own institutions, their own um, cultures in a way that is empowering for them. And I think that's um, you know, no accident, federal Indian law, while well, indigenous peoples have tried to use it for all that they can, um, it is a, a creation in large part of the federal government, which was interested in dispossessing Indian tribes of their lands 
and their cultures and their economies in its formative years and is only now working toward reform um, towards anti-discrimination and fairness and justice and so on. So we have these deep historical roots that are, that are pretty tough to deal with. In any event, I did want to say a few things, and I seem to be focusing on the US context, but internationally, I have had the chance to work with my colleagues in a number of countries around the world. And I think um, a common observation that we've made is that this really is the era of implementing the declaration. Now that um, it depends a little bit how you count, but originally 143 or 144 nation states um, voted in favor of the declaration in 2007. The United States got on board um, through President Obama's statement of support in 2010. In 2016, through the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, all 193 member states of the UN agreed to work toward implementation of the declaration. And that um, World Conference also led to the revised mandate of the body that I serve on, MRIP, the UN Expert Mechanism, um, and our uh, charge to work on implementation. So you see this whole succession of development. Some of the matters that we've been asked to um, provide advice on um, include issues of self-government and self-identity. Um, so for example, in um, Finland, the Sami parliament invited the expert mechanism to provide advice on the Sami parliament act, which concerns how um, individuals are identified as Sami people for purposes of voting um, in Sami elections. And it goes to the heart of political participation as well as um, voting rights, um, identity, and other really essential qualities. And the Sami parliament asked us to provide advice to and to facilitate dialogue with the national government so that everybody would kind of be on the same page about what the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples expects in a case like that. And it expects self-determination. It expects that um, Indigenous Peoples' own representative institutions will be in a position to use their laws, customs, and traditions to um, shape important institutions like the Sami Parliament. We were also invited to um, provide advice in Mexico City when Mexico City adopted a new constitution um, for its federal district that expressly incorporated the declaration, all 46 articles. And um, Mexico City was trying to figure out how to adopt secondary legislation to put those new constitutional provisions in place. And this included on issues like free prior informed consent, which we've discussed on um, land rights, indigenous people's land rights within Mexico City, on language rights, community rights, health rights, and so on. And in that case, we were able to use the modality not only of providing text, technical advice, which is kind of the, the UN speak for some legal analysis, but also to facilitate dialogue. And so we went out to communities, Indigenous villages, we listen to folks um, talk about their understanding of the declaration. Um, if they didn't already know about it, we shared some info. Women in particular in those villages were really, really eager to learn about their rights under the declaration and how those rights could inform implementation of this new exciting constitution. And we took those meetings from the community um, and then went back and had training sessions with um, different um, government officials and department leaders um, in Mexico City to try to help provide um, advice about implementing those different provisions. Um, I could go on and on about our, our other um, engagements, and I guess I'll just mention two briefly because I know I'm running out of time and I've hardly touched on my other two points, but um, we had a really fascinating country engagement in New Zealand where the New Zealand government as well as Maori leaders got together on a joint request and invited MRIP to come provide advice on a national action plan for implementing the declaration. And while I personally wasn't on that matter, um, my colleagues were, and I think one of the most uh, remarkable 
parts of that um, engagement was not only that it was a joint request from the state and indigenous peoples, which shows that it's not just indigenous peoples who are trying to effectuate these rights, but states too, and they can work cooperatively to do this. But also that um, MRIP really focused on indigenous peoples, laws, customs, and traditions when it comes to procedure and protocol and made sure that the advice concerned not only substantive implementation of things like land rights um, or children's rights, which are so critical, but also included modalities of consultation and participation that um, any successful national action plan would have to embrace in order to be legitimate, not only from the um, New Zealand side, but from the Maori side as well. And then finally, for a couple of years, um, I had the opportunity to work with my colleague, Megan Davis, and the Yaqui people um, from both Mexico and the United States on a repatriation request addressed to the government of Sweden to reclaim their sacred Masakova, a religious um, and cultural item, a, consecrated deer head that had been um, taken from the Yaqui people almost 100 years before when they were conscripted in the Mexican army during the Yaqui wars. And we had the opportunity to work um, for quite a long time helping to develop the record on the removal of the item from the community and also the standards under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples for repatriation um, of a sacred or ceremonial object um, which is potentially pathbreaking because even while some countries like here in the United States, we have pretty strong law on repatriation within our national boundaries. Um, there's not a great deal of law on indigenous people's claims for repatriation internationally, especially directly to them. There are international conventions on repatriation from nation state to nation state, but from indigenous people's perspective, they often want and need to claim repatriation um, of the item back to their community. So all of this is to say there have been lots of lessons learned about um, implementing the declaration. One is that um, the modalities of providing technical advice and facilitating dialogue that MRIP is entrusted to use have been really successful. It's a different way of operating. These are modalities of diplomacy and they're not modalities of litigation, which is perhaps where I was more comfortable as a US based lawyer, or at least appellate brief writing, which I had done a lot of. And so instead of trying to um, you know, make the most forceful version of an argument, um, implementing the declaration under a diplomatic posture can involve um, finding mutual interests and advancing, as Judge Bigler said, a human rights paradigm um, for the collective benefit of all. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy. It's usually contested and, and difficult and requires um, a long process of developing information and relationship building and setting the scene to allow those conversations to happen. And there is so much more to be done. And one of the other lessons has been just how tremendous this project is. And the expert mechanisms um, purview is worldwide and there are only seven of us. Um, and the work is just tremendous. There are other um, mechanisms within the United Nations that work on indigenous people's issues in different capacities. Um, but that's our, our way of working. Um, to switch gears back to the United States for just a couple of minutes, um, my work at the United Nations really made me very interested in thinking about, well, how could we do this work of implementation here in the United States? Now, of course, I wasn't the only one thinking about that, and colleagues at the Native American Rights Fund, I think several of whom are on the call, um, John Echohawk, the executive director, as well as Sue Noe and Kim Goschalk and Brett Shelton, um, have also been very seriously interested in how the UN Declaration could support tribes' advocacy interests here in the United States, whether that is in litigation or in legislation or in um, regulatory administrative law efforts, and at different levels or venues of government, tribal, state, um, and federal. 
And in 2018, through the leadership, again, of Dean Gemini'a and Executive Director John Echohawk, um, as well as Heather whiteman Ronsham, who was then at the Native American Rights Fund, we got together and formed a joint project to implement the Declaration in the United States. And our website is in the chat. And we have been um, approaching this project through a number of activities, and I won't have time to go into great detail, but we have been um, working, I think, on two prongs. One is education, public education about the declaration um, in tribal communities, in law schools, among lawyers and others. And then the other is um, what I think of as research and advocacy. So doing work with our students and with community members like Judge Bigler and many of the folks on the call to put together um, research that will answer the questions that are being re raised in tribal communities about how the declaration could help them. And Judge Bigler you know, did some amazing issue spotting as a law professor would call it when it comes to for example, implementing the Declaration in Religious Freedoms. And I think I will um, talk about that for a moment before I conclude. Um, I, I started by saying, you know, one of the things that inspired me to get involved in international law in the first place was the limits of federal law when it comes to protecting American Indian sacred sites. And as Judge Bigler mentioned, that's not only, you know, the big cases that make it to the US Supreme Court or the federal appellate courts, but daily life for tribal ceremonial folks, and Greg Johnson, for example, has worked um, in Hawaii. Um, I don't know if Hale Aloha Ayao is on the call, um, Honor Keeler is on the call. Lots of folks who have been doing this work for years, day in and day out, um, have been working with Indigenous peoples who are trying to articulate a basis to make sure that those ceremonies um, can continue um, and that they have the rights and also the opportunity to meet the responsibilities that they have, um, whether it's to other tribal members, to the land, to the natural world, as Judge Bigler said, to the spirits themselves. These are things that are um, not readily found um, in US federal law, but they're nonetheless critical to ensuring indigenous people's religious freedoms. And one of the amazing things um, about the UN Declaration is lots of those concepts, those themes, those principles are there in the Declaration. And so I'll mention briefly that, for example, Article 12 of the Declaration um, discusses the right of, or recognizes, I should say, the right of Indigenous peoples to manifest, practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions. And it mentions specifically um, cultural sites, religious sites, ceremonial objects, all of those things that are not expressly articulated in the First Amendment of the Constitution, and unfortunately have been written out of potential protection um, by the federal courts. Now, I'm hoping the federal courts will switch gears and start to recognize that those are things that should be protected under the First Amendment. And one of the ways that the Declaration can be helpful in the United States is an, as an interpretive device for the courts. So we as advocates can lead the courts in that direction through our briefing. Um, and share with the courts perhaps that um, it's not an anomaly when a tribe is arguing for the necessity of access to a sacred place. And it's not an anomaly when actual practices like the ones Judge Bigler mentioned are critical to ensuring the religious freedoms um, which can't be maintained solely in a protected sphere of internal belief, which is what the US Supreme Court has tended to protect instead of those external manifestations in community that are so important to indigenous peoples. I'd also like to mention um, Article 25 in the religious freedoms context and in the implementing the de declaration um, context, because it describes that indigenous peoples have a right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationships with lands. I think like the ceremonial places Judge Bigler is talking about, and also to uphold their responsibilities to future generations in this regard. And when I hear Judge Bigler talking about the last old woman and the relationship between the old Yuchi women and the young Yuchi children, 
and the necessity to make sure that intergenerational transmission of information persists so that the ceremonies will stay alive, so that people will know how to do the things they need to know at the ceremonial grounds. To me, Article 25 potentially gives life to that and it's um, terminal, legal terminology that can help perhaps to breathe life um, into our advocacy when we're doing it in the courts or doing it through legislation um, or doing it through um, administrative regulatory work. And I've um, somewhat overstayed my time that I wanted to be on the, um, the conversation, but I guess like Judge Bigler, I'm gonna take two more minutes to just wrap it up. In terms of other things we might do for implementation in religious freedoms as kind of an example that you could extrapolate it. In addition to litigation, we could work on um, amending some of the statutes like the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act, the National Historic Preservation Act to embrace what Professor Johnson was talking about earlier, that requirement of free prior and informed consent when it comes to actions that might adversely affect indigenous people's sacred sites. And the idea that federal agencies have not only to consult, but also come to mutual agreement with tribes regarding those um, sites. And then when it comes to working, so that's kind of a legislative approach. And when it comes to working with agencies in particular, and we're already having the opportunity to do this in some ways, President Biden's new um, executive uh, directive, I'm forgetting the word for it, requiring agencies to revisit their um, uh, consultation uh, procedures gives us an opportunity to help agencies come to understand how they could do um, free prior informed consent as a more robust approach to consultation when it comes to these religious freedoms issues on the public lands. And in closing, I should say that um, the wonderful new book by Professor McNally that everybody has mentioned, Defend the Sacred, which I've just finished reviewing for the Harvard Law Review. Um, Professor McNally provides um, some of these thoughts um, that I think uh, provide an, a platform to think about how we could do this federal advocacy um, inspired by and informed by the declaration in a way that could improve um, the rights of indigenous peoples um, as a matter of religious freedom. And I think this is also a template for implementing the declaration here in the United States um, in other realms as well, whether that's land or child welfare um, or the environment and other matters that we're looking at. So thank you for giving me this time to share my thoughts and I will go on mute for a moment. Thank you, Professor Carpenter. Um... I'm not sure anyone's ever said more about the UNDRIP in 30 minutes before. That was quite a tour de force, thank you. And Justice Bigler, you anchored us so well in, in a powerful way. Uh, I have just a couple observations and then a question for each of you, but I wanna invite our audience. We just have one very good question in the chat. I'm hoping for a couple more. We can go until 5.30 Pacific time. Uh, so if anyone has a question, put it in there. But uh, for the time being, like I said, a reflection or two, and then a question for each. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Carpenter, you I really appreciated where you spoke about diplomacy, that the UNDRIP, it's not about litigation, it's not law in that sense. Uh, it can inform litigation, right? But the way it's been leveraged in diplomatic contexts, you mentioned Hale Aloha Iyao, and I just want to say, um, having a front row seat to the repatriation of the Dresden artifacts or human remains uh, ancestors from, from Dresden, Germany uh, in 2017, it was so powerful to see that take place because as you know, Hale Aloha Yao and his team had worked on that for 20 years. They had pressed on US law, German law, every possible lever getting nowhere. It was being able to speak in a broader language of human rights and diplomacy and really reaching people at that level and saying, look, these international ideals have been articulated and embraced by others. Can't you see the importance of this way of framing it? And can't you help us get our ancestors home? 
And that's finally what happened. So the, the, the declaration was invoked, but not in a hard way, in more of a soft way, in a way of cultivating a community, a way of assuring the museum that they weren't losing in this transaction. They were actually gaining relationships. They were gaining people they could speak to about how to better interpret their exhibits and so forth. And I, I frankly would have never understood that side of it had I not been uh, had I not witnessed it, now that's really part of what I hold uh, in mind about the UNDRIP is the capacity just to bring out the human in these settings and to foster those sensibilities. Um, <clears throat> Judge Bigler, thank you so much for sharing um, overall and particularly your stories. Uh, I find it so powerful and, and also chilling uh, to hear a story about the possible end of Yuchi speakers from a Yuchi speaker, um, that, that just hits. Uh, and, and that leads to a question, I'm gonna pose a question to each of you and then I'll stop. That question about the dwindling numbers and the obligation, Kuleana as Hawaiians would call it, to, to live and do it, but in the face of those dwindling numbers, the question for Professor Carpenter is, with the, the expert mechanism work you do, how is it that you do triage when, when you're dealing with, say, groups as large as the Maori, you mentioned them, and there are many needs across all kinds of issues. But then you also have needs from very small communities whose languages are quite literally dying, and you're only a seven-person body with limited resources. How do you do that triage? What, and what else, how might people support that work, I guess, is the question. Then following up for Professor Bigler, hoping with you that we're not at the end of the Yuchi speakers, right? That the youth will need to take that place. Well, you shared with me this week some, some other stories that you didn't recite today. And one is about the college kid the, who's um, born into the culture, but isn't living it in the way you described. Tell us about how you envision that college kid and how he might see and smell the coffee, as you put it, is tell us, I'm asking you to tell us something hopeful at the end of a pretty hard story, uh, because I know you're hopeful. Uh, tell us where that goes, how, and there, by the way, there are a number of college kids on this call who are similarly situated. They come from indigenous communities, but they're learning their ways in classrooms, in activist communities, all this, not, none of which is wrong. But what would your words be to them about, don't let the old lady be right? You want me to go first? <laughs> uh, show up, that's the big thing. And uh, uh, I know that the, uh, there was one of the things that really gained national attention of recent was the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, that was a, appears to be heading in the right direction for the uh, Dakota people. Uh, we're thankful for that. And I know that there was also involved uh, religious and sacred issues there. Uh, I know that I have upset some native people uh, that I've talked to specifically because uh, I'm happy for that and I hope that they go the right direction. Well, we had some people of our own who went up there a thousand miles north, but they wouldn't go 10 miles to cut wood for our fireplace so we could dance show up to cut the wood. Uh, just being there is a mammoth support. Uh, I'll tell one more story. Um, that this is comes from one of my uh, Muscogee friends, Amiko, a chief, a traditional chief, and he, unfortunately he passed away here just recently. He sat on that chief spot for 50, 60 years. He was the third chief for that ceremony ground since 1830s. If you think about that, he could tell stories back that way. He said, and this is talking in a metaphorical sense, but he said, when I was made a chief, they gave me a bag and they put one rock in that bag for every one of my members from my, from my tribal town, from my ceremonial grounds. And I have to carry that bag the rest of my life. When we have a dance, the members that show up, they take the rock out and they carry it for that dance. And I feel so light and happy and I so, feel so good to see those members here and that joy. I just fills my heart. 
at the end of the dance when we're done in the morning, they put their rock back, rock back in that bag. When we have a work party, those men folk that show up, they take their rock out and carry it. They carry their own rock with them while we're, while we're gathering wood or hunting medicines. Or those women, when they're cooking, they take their rock with them and they carry it. But at the end of that day, they put it back. That's my job from the moment I accept this position to the moment I die. So that's his job, 24 seven, his members thinking about it. But we can go and lighten that load for him. All we have to do is show up, work parties, visiting. You never know what you will have. Maybe you're just talking about football or maybe you're talking about your aunts and uncles, but maybe at some point they talk about something else. You never know. You have to be there to learn. Ours is something you learn from participation and viewing. I still have so much I have to learn from, and I look watching that fireplace, participating and understanding. Ours is not something you can gain from a book. I can talk to it about through over Zoom. I can talk about it, write about it, but unless you are there, that feeling can never be expressed and understood. So. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense to me. Professor Carpenter, please. How can you uh, do more work? <laughs> I'm tempted to give the, the same answer. So your question was about you know, how to triage, I think, the overwhelming um, opportunities and needs of indigenous peoples around the world, and especially when they're so differently situated and there's some very small communities and, and some large ones. Um, and I'm almost tempted to give the same answer that Judge Baylor did, which is to show up and cut the wood. I mean, there's, there is no way through this work except through it and sometimes it is really, really overwhelming, but um, you know, all any of us can do is as, as much as we possibly can, I think. Um, I mean, some of the things I've learned over the last five years are that um, in both the international and the US work is that what the most powerful work that's happening is in indigenous communities themselves. And one of the things that we're doing in the NARF CU project right now, and we're about to publish actually, is a tribal implementation toolkit for the UN declaration. So rather than looking, and of course we are gonna look to the federal government and we will be writing those briefs and we will be you know, asking for legislation, but uh, tribal communities themselves are also interested in you know, passing their own laws and educating their own members. And those are, if we can provide the tools, we've called it a toolkit, um, the basic information that will allow them to kind of take the declaration where they want it to go, um, then it's, um, you know, a community-based effort. And those, you know, little tiny communities to the huge tribes can all adapt the declaration and use it in ways that are consonant with their resources and aspirations and so on. Um, so I guess one of the things I'd like to say is that, um, you know, the, the real power of this is, is not, you know, top-down work, but is indigenous peoples um, deciding how they want to engage. Um, but the other, I mean, a sort of less uh, optimistic view is that I think for, for many indigenous peoples, um, you know, having the resources to access the United Nations or be able to go to New York or Geneva it is just not realistic. And so even the cases that I've mentioned, those are, a, and we do have dozens of requests um, in the expert mechanism from all regions of the world, but even the communities that have the resources to make those requests, I think are, you know, uh, privileged in, in some ways. And so I think that really, diffusing those um, opportunities for advocacy is um, going to be critical to um, making a difference around the world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. So much work. Um, okay, we have two questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, Judge Bigler just answered one of them, uh, but um, why don't we take those two and uh, see what you both have to say about it, and then we'll call it a day. If you're okay with that. So the first disappeared, but it had to do, well, Judge Bigler, you can tell us what the answer is, but it had to do with the difference between Western rights frameworks and indigenous rights frameworks. Uh, and then the second um, 
from Jesus um, is the role of stories in healing. So to say something about the role of stories in healing. And let's, let's hear from you both and then we'll, uh, we'll thank you and, and call it a day. Well, I think in uh, stories are, um, and I can't talk about everybody else, but for our ceremonies, and we don't know all the stories anymore. Uh, and that's part of the, uh, what we're talking about is that so many of these things with our people that are people that I know, my traditional people, my clan, the traditional chiefs, the clan leaders, the head women, there are so few of us. And there are uh, these things, this knowledge has been funneled down into just a few. So I'm not sure that it's all been passed along like it would, would have if we had 200 or 500 people who to, to, to know all these things. But um, <laughs> each of our things that we do at our ground has a story behind it that we know of. Why it is that we use those crane feathers where those songs came from. There's a st whole story that Newman Little Bear used to talk about. Why you use those crane feathers and how we got those songs from there or what that bead dance is or why it is that we do these uh, lizard dance. And so those stories explain and articulate our understanding and vision. And for us, we say that those songs that we do at our ceremonies, some of them are medicine songs, they're healing songs. And so we don't necessarily know which ones are which anymore. And now uh, for stomp dance, some of the grounds do it out in public and they'll go on and put on exhibitions. But some of, the, some of the grounds and some of our own chiefs now are not comfortable doing that because they are considering that. And that but that's up to each grounds. Each ceremonial people have to make those decisions for themselves. But these songs are twins, they're alive. And that's one of the things I also think of is that they have a right to be sung because if they don't, they go away. What happens to them then? So they're both healing and continuing and giving life. And that's why we have that joy with them. Uh, and that's why music brings happiness, whether it's sacred or not, you know, I think that's true. And, and that's tied together. Songs and stories are very similar. Professor Carpenter, did you wish to add to that or tackle the other question or? Um, Let's, we, can, we can cheat and look at uh, Judge Bigler's answer. Well, there is one one thing. I I mean, first of all, I defer to Judge Bigler in in this and in all things. Um, and I I always feel lucky when I have the chance to listen to his stories. And we were talking recently about um, the fact that last March, before everything shut down for COVID, Judge Bigler and his wife Don. Actually, we're here in Boulder and brought over pizza and drinks and hung out with my kids and told them stories. And, you know, they're a rascally 12 and 14 year old in Boulder and they, but they sat there and listened. And I mean, those are kids even younger than the college kids, but telling those stories gives people an opportunity to listen. And, um, you know, hopefully that, I don't know, that narrative is, um, is powerful on its own. But it also, I guess two other things I wanna say about it is it teaches, but it teaches in different ways. So some stories I think have to do with um, ceremony or arts or entertainment. Um, some stories though are really about, and because I'm a lawyer, I think about this, laws, customs and traditions. And they contain, um, they contain law and they contain law that is going to be important to reconstituting indigenous societies. And so again, when I worked on the Yaqui repatriation matter, one of the really fundamental insights was when Sweden and the Yaqui people could understand that they each had law. Um, the Yaqui people had law about the Masakova, that it was inalienable, that it was held by a particular society, that it could only be taken care of by men. And Sweden had law about you know, the treatment of items in museums, collections. And so reaching that understanding, like you're saying in the diplomatic sense, Greg, is you know, I, I think part of how this um, declaration can play out. But for the Yaki people, that um, law was, was in stories. I mean, that, that's where it was. And there were affidavits from people. Um, so I think you know, what, what is the healing function of stories that I think it can be individual, it can be collective. Um, and um, 
it makes me almost hopeful, even though I gave up hope in 2020, but it makes me almost hopeful for, for 2021. I know we only have two minutes left, so I'm not going to try to tackle the other question, but I'm going to make one more plug. Matthew Fletcher has a wonderful new book called The Ghost Road, which is about um, stories, and it's about Anishinaabe stories as a source of law um, to counter federal Indian law, to counter Indian hating. So for those who are interested in exploring this more, I would encourage them to read his work as well as Judge Bigler's. Fantastic. That's a great recommendation. Thank you. He's at Michigan State. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, since I think your theme was hope for the future, I think that uh, we do have hope because uh, we still have young people showing up. And uh, one of our Friday night dances, we go through all this 45 minutes, an hour of the dance. And our chief was always uh, very adamant that after we get done with it, when we finish that dance and we're all done, we have to return to the men folk have to return to the arbor and sit there until they're dismissed because that shows to everybody here, the past, the fireplace, that we are still here and we are still here and our young people are still coming and attending. Now that, that's, that's always hopeful. Well, I can't imagine a better note to end on because uh, as Professor Carpenter said, hope these days is in thin supply. Although we've turned some corners um, and, uh, and tonight gives me cause for hope. And, and I just want to express gratitude. The audience can't unmute themselves in a webinar, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm sure if they could, they would, they would express their gratitude with me to have you both here to share stories and knowledge and, and hope, um, sober hope, uh, is, is a big thing for all of us. And, and I'm, I'm grateful. So I want to just pass that along on behalf of everybody. Uh, your, the gift of your time um, is very important to us all. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, audience, for being with us. Do uh, check out our website. Tune in for those spring events. Pua Case and Kayleen Sisk will be awesome, as will Nick Tilson. So, and I hope everyone has some good weeks ahead. Spring is coming and, and join us again soon. Again, Professor Carpenter, Judge Bigler, thank you. Thanks, Greg. It's been great to be with you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Bye, guys.